afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another one of LGW's Frontline Conversations. I'm Doug Duncan, the President and CEO of Leadership Greater Washington. I want to welcome you all here. Thank you for attending these conversations that we've had. Uh, and we've got a great one for you today. So on Friday, we had uh, Harold John Wesley. And Monday, we had David Bowers. Now today, we've got Han Lee. And we're talking about anti-racism and strategies to incorporate that, and to, to affect that, to make that happen. So Han, uh, let's start with that. How are you doing personally? How are you feeling? How's life and COVID been for you? Um, it's kind of all over the place, to be truthful. I mean, in many ways, you know, my work is my passion and what I believe in and what I value. So especially in these times when we see so many racial disparities, I feel extra super purposeful. And that's kind of how I channel a lot of my energy is into my work. So that's awesome. Um, really busy challenge, but also, you know, exhausted, tired, um, um, sometimes frustrated. But I think all in all, overall, it's just really hopeful because I just, I feel like we're in a moment that is, is different than past moments. So I think overall hopeful. And how's your staff doing? They, you've been uh, working from home for, what, about 12, 13 weeks now. So how, how's that going? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, when we first started, I think there was, I mean, there's still a lot of uncertainty um, because of the, um, the pandemic and, and certainly now, um, but with, with the threat of a second wave and other, other, other concerns. And I think when we first started working remotely, we were just trying to figure out where everyone was emotionally and realizing there was a lot of anxiety amongst the team and that was manifesting in different ways. So I've done a lot of kind of educating myself about anxiety and how people, um, people react to that and engage with it. Um, so that's been like, that was, you know, that was a little rocky at first, but now I think we've gotten into a rhythm and can read each other better through the phone and through Zoom. Um, and I personally never thought that I would want to telecommute. I always love going into the office, but I found that this, it's actually been really a great way to be incredibly productive for my own home and not have to commute and, and spend a lot of time traveling. And I think my team is finding that as well. And we're intentionally building in ways that we can connect as a team together beyond just staff meetings, just social lunches and things like that. So we are attending to each other. So give us some tips on relieving anxiety and stress. What, what have you learned? <laughs> um, so I, I so um, Brene Brown, just amazing timing because she's so wise. She um, start she released a new podcast, kind of right when a lot of us went into social distancing, called Unlocking Us. And one of her first, not the first, but one of the earlier podcasts in the series was about anxiety and how people typically either overperform or underperform as a way to manage that anxiety, right? And so it might come across as you're being frenetic and freaking out and um, all over the place or that you're just zoned out and you're, you're, you know, you're not um, contributing, et cetera. But it, a lot of that, how people um, manage their anxiety is based on kind of a, a survival mechanism, right? A fight or flight mechanism. And so that has been really instructive for me to kind of engage with not just my team, but board members, with other colleagues, and then definitely myself. And so one of the things, one of the things that I love um, that I've discovered, I invested in kind of at the right time, getting a Peloton bike, <laughs> right when uh, we went into social distancing in March. And I discovered a group of other women who work in philanthropy, many of whom are Leadership Greater Washington. And we started doing group rides together. So just like exercise, kind of, um, I consider myself an introvert, but I love the company of others. And so doing something like that together at the same time, while working a lot, off a lot of anxiety, anxious energy has been, has been great and something that I didn't, I didn't think I'd, you know, I'd get into. So, so there's an LGW Peloton group, is that right? It's not, it's not a, I call them, I call them my philanthro friends. So it's okay. a, 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 a small group of women in philanthropy, some of whom are LGW. But if you, if any of you are interested in doing a ride with us, um, we, uh, my, my, what is my screen name? It's Ride for Justice DC. <laughs> ride for Justice DC is my Peloton Justice name. DC. That's great. So. And um, I just, I might be, my internet, just through, my internet keep, keeps going in and out, but I'll be connected via phone. So if y'all lose video, I'm still here on yep. audio. So the Weisberg Foundation, you, um, your foundation was mainly arts focused until you came aboard and they made a conscious decision 
to go to the racial equity sector? Is that, um, tell us how, what happened there and how, how that, that process worked. And we will have Han back in one second. We can't hear you, but we can see you now. Oh, no. There we go. Can you, 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 okay, you can hear me now. The Foundation I did, I did. From arts to racial equity. Talk yeah, th I'm sorry. Sure. So it's funny, a lot of people think that we were an only an arts funder in the region. And I think that's because that was our most public um, giving area. We've been around for 30 years, always as a social justice foundation and a family foundation, but with non-family members from the start. And um, like a lot of small family foundations, though, I think a lot of our giving was very driven by individual trustee interest. So we were working under this broader umbrella of social justice, but we might have had, we had one, a, a couple of, of trustees who were really interested in the arts, particular theater arts, right? So a lot of our giving was there. There was some in like environment and outdoor education. There was stuff around even internationally giving in South America uh, for women, women and girls, um, media and messaging. And so I think before I came onto the foundation, the, um, the trustees realized as we were not fully funded yet, so we are continuing to get assets into our donations from our founder into the foundation. They knew that as we continue to grow, they needed to focus the giving more to have more of an intentional impact. And so I started about four years ago and my first task was to work with the board on a strategic plan, a new strategic framework. And it was really fortuitous timing because at the time, the Washington Regional Association of Grant Makers was doing their uh, putting racism on the table learning series. And so I started going to those sessions. And, and as we were talking to our trustees, grantee partners, other community members, it became clear that as you looked at all of our apparently disparate grant making over almost 30 years, but the common thread in all of it was that we were giving to organizations that existed to address deep inequities in society, mostly racial inequities, right? So we're like, that's, that's so clearly the thread. And if we learned anything from the putting the racism on the series, we need to name race. And so that's when we really started to center racial equity in our work. And then, you know, and that was a journey. Even when I started, we had a diversity in theater program we would never have a diversity program now, right? We would talk about racial equity or racial justice or anti-racism. So we are continuing to, to, to learn and to deepen our analysis. Um, and to the point of where our last round of grants this past fall was explicitly to organizations that were people of color led, right? The entire cohort is all people of color led. So I think that's an example of, or just, just to speak to kind of the, the learning journey that kind of got us to this new framework and this, this racial equity analysis. And also to say that we are still learning. You know, we set an intentional goal as a foundation, as a board and staff this year, to increase our understanding of what it means to be an anti-racist organization and really operationalize those practices through governance, through operations, and through programs. And that learning, um, it's hard. I'm going to be honest. It's not, it's not easy work. It's constant work. And it causes a lot of discomfort and tension. Um, but if we really believe in what we say we're about, which is building power of those most negatively impacted by racism, we need to keep doing that work ourselves in, in, internally as well. So I want to get back to that one second. But I do want to talk about, you said you started with the, uh, the RAG uh, series on putting race on the table. And then we, um, we LGW, mm -hmm. joined with RAG to sponsor uh, uh, expanding the table for racial equity, yes. series, which is very successful. And then we also sponsored two civil rights trips, uh, civil rights tours of the South from Mississippi to Alabama. Um, you were the facilitator for the second trip of that. What, what were your, I, I went on the first trip. It was, as I've said to people, it was one of the most depressing things I've been on, but also one of the most uplifting. It's depressing in that the sites we went to, it's, it, most of them were where people were murdered. Um, mm -hmm. Poor girls, Martin Luther King, um, yeah. Your Evers. I mean, just you, just you just went through all this violence down there. And then you're thinking, yeah. ha this happened, what, 40, 50 years ago, 
and how much has changed since then, but really how little has changed that we've seen over the last five years. So any reflections you have on the, on the trip uh, um, that you took or that you led? Yeah, well, I, I will say I was, um, we worked with someone who facilitated the itinerary and did all that. And my role um, was to be, to help people process what was happening and to think about, okay, this is what we just learned. This is just what, what we just experienced. What does that mean to me um, when I, you know, given my perspectives, my identities, my history, and then what might that mean for what I'm going to do after I leave this trip and go back to work, go back home, go back to school or wherever. And so, um, yeah, it was deeply depressing in many ways, very real, uh, very powerful and hard. And I think, um, and, and so important for everyone to do, right? If you are able to go down south and have that immersive learning experience and to hear from people who are foot soldiers in the civil rights movement, who are leaders in the civil rights movement while they're still with us. It is, is a deeply powerful thing to do and worth the investment. But if you can't, there's like that's part of this anti-racism work, right? Is really learning the history and learning the history that we weren't taught in schools and learning history that's not always uh, accurately represented in, uh, uh, in pop culture and in, in media and learning our own histories, right? As an, an Asian American woman, I never, I, I was a science major in college. I didn't take any <laughs> Asian American courses or ethnicity courses. And I was doing my best to kind of assimilate into white dominant culture because that's what I, I ta was taught either implicitly or explicitly I needed to do to be successful. And it wasn't until later in my adulthood and certainly in the last several years where I'm really understanding what it means to be Asian American and what it means to be Asian American um, in the context of this, this, this false narrative of hierarchy between black and white, right? Kind of in the middle as a wedge intentionally. So what does that mean uh, for my experiences and how people engage with me? And what does that mean in terms of what I see as my role in this fight for racial justice and in doing anti-racism work, right? So I think understanding that the shared history, our country's history, our personal histories um, is really, really important when we talk about racial justice and anti-racism work. So when we can get back together, we are, we LGW is planning a civil rights tour of, of this area it's in Alexandria, um, in DC, sort of the, the history of African-Americans over the last couple hundred years uh, in this in this region and we were going to mm -hmm. finish it at the wharf and have someone talk about the significance of president obama and what that meant to the country but now we've got a new ending place we're going to end at black lives matter plaza and talk about that. wow now i think that's it that, I mean, <laughs> we need to be able to get together to do this so we will, we yeah. will do that as soon as we can so so let me get that's back to what amazing we're, let me get back to what you were talking yeah. about earlier, the anti-racism. What does it mean to be an anti-racist organization? You talked about the difficulties and all that. Well, what does that, what does that mean for you? Yeah, um, and I would say obviously Ibram, Ibram Kendi, who's written about, about how to be an anti-racist is I think the, the foremost expert in this. But essentially the concept is that if, if we agree, and I think many of us, probably everyone on this call may probably, or you probably wouldn't have signed up for it, agrees that we live in a society that is systemically, that, that, that um, is systemically racist, structurally racist, right? That the air and the water around us is racism. So if we are just kind of going with the flow, then we are perpetuating racism, right? So there's no such thing as being uh, a non-racist because if you're, there, there's no kind of non-racist state. So you're either kind of going with the flow, which means that you are perpetuating this, this systemic racism that's baked into who we are, or you're actively being anti-racist, right? In what you say, what you do, um, how you engage, how you support people, how you don't, et cetera. And so it's very active and it's very intentional. And I think it's I think when the language wasn't as socialized um, or whenever we start talking about race, um, there, I'll be honest, there's a lot of fragility and there's a lot of um, pushback against it. And I think that now that it's more socialized and people better understand what it means, um, people are more open to kind of examining kind of anti-racism and how that, or racism and how it shows up 
in their lives. And I you know, think it's important to talk about the different levels of racism, because oftentimes people think about kind of, you know, the interpersonal racism, which is really, it's real, and we've experienced or per, per, uh, all perpetrated it ourselves, right, in some way. But there's individualized racism, right? So me as an Asian American woman, buying into the model minority myth that I had to be a certain way, um, that is a form of individualized racism, right? Um, kind of believing the narrative out there about us that's racialized. There's interpersonal racism, so racism that happens between people, right, between two individuals or more than two individuals, um, and that's often in what people say and do um, to each other. And then the, the third level is institutional racism. So in our own organizations, our companies, um, you know, the government, like there's racism kind of baked into the institutions in which we're engaged. And then there's structural systemic racism. That's kind of how all of those things weave together and are deeply interconnected, right, into a system that, um, that honestly is really hard to undo. Um, and that's why when we're talking about, especially in this moment with COVID-19, and all of the state sanctioned violence, police violence, brutality that we're seeing against black bodies and brown bodies, that when you know people say we need to fix the fix the broken system, it's really the system is, I know it can be cliche, but the system is working the way it was designed to work, right? By kind of in this context and this climate of racism. So we actually need to think about how can we create new systems, anti-racist systems systems that are really gonna to lead to justice and liberation, uh, especially for black and brown people, but for all people ultimately. So how do you do that? How do you operationalize that? Do you, do you go after the <laughs> three levels of racism? I mean, how do you do that in, in an organization? Yeah. Well, that's a really good question because sometimes people are like, well, let's do, let's work at this level or we have to work with this level. And I, I hear it a lot. Um, we have to be able to work at all four levels at the same time. And we can do this, right? We can do hard things. Um, and so, you know, and, and I think oftentimes because systemic racism is so pervasive um, and so egregious, it, it's hard to know where to start. And I would say you got to start, right? And um, that means, so I'll use the example from our foundation board. So if you just look at our grant making, our mission, what we are doing is investing in uh, mainly people of color led organizations that are building power through advocacy, organizing and civic engagement in communities of color to advance systemic change for racial equity. So like that's our, that's our systems level work, right? Um, and also working within philanthropy to, to ensure that or hope in the hopes that philanthropy becomes more equitable. But then you got to look into our own foundation, right? Our institution. And what are the practices that we are or aren't engaged in that are either perpetuating racism or, um, or anti-racist? And so like, I think of the three dimensions of our organization, most organizations, right? There's the board, there's all of the operations, and there's the program stuff, the mission work. And, so, and then there's the culture that all of that swims in. And so it's kind of, it can in, involve, it needs training, right? Training that we're doing both uh, individualized training for individual board and staff members, and then group shared learning together. Um, it takes kind of assessing your practices and doing an audit. Uh, we uh, did an internal power audit to see how we're engaging with power uh, to advance or not advance equity. Um, it takes um, kind of listening to and hearing feedback and kind of decentering whiteness and making sure that our work is informed by those who are most negatively impacted by racism, right? So people of color, uh, particularly black people. And so listening to and hearing that and following the leadership of, uh, of those individuals with the lived experience, um, it takes, honestly, I'll talk about power. It, ta it takes kind of within our institutions and beyond building power, right? Um, sharing power and then, and then wielding our power for equity intentionally. And I think this term power is often, there's so many negative connotations with power. And um, I heard Eric Liu speak, he founded Citizen University. He spoke at a RAG annual meeting probably three years ago. And he shared the three laws of power that have always really, I, 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 I like frameworks and I don't, I don't know. Um, I love frameworks. So, so three, three laws of power. power. Um, the first two laws kind of, yeah, I, I can get why power might be perceived as negative. So the first law is that power um, 
pools and it concentrates, right? So the more power you have, the more power you get, because it's just the nature of power to pool and concentrate. Um, power, relatedly, also, it's self-justified. So I've got this power, Han, because I run a foundation and I earned this, I worked really hard, and so I deserve this power that I got, right? Um, and, then, and then the third law of power, which we often forget about, is that power is infinite and power can be created, right? And so I think oftentimes, I, I do think that a lot of us with um, positional privilege need to think about seeding power. I think that is important. And at the same time, I think we can also have less of a scarcity mindset and have more of an abundance mindset and realize that power is infinite and power can be created. So if you're building power and sharing power, that doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, that you're going to lose all of your power and power isn't, isn't a bad thing. So I think, so I, you know, talked about the systems change, talk about the institutional change and then, um, that individual interpersonal stuff, the personal stuff, I will tell you, is the hardest piece of it, right? I think people are really good at saying many, many of us who are out there on Black Lives Matter Plaza protesting and demonstrating for, um, for Black lives, we, we get it. We're like, yes, like the system needs to change. Racism is bad. But then when, when we are called out for doing something that is racist, like, whoa, hold on, right? No, I'm not a racist, right? Um, but, but we have to acknowledge, like I was saying before, that we live and operate in a racist system in a racist environment. And so being called a racist isn't, or, or, or being uh, accused or called out for doing something that, that's racist, unless we develop that muscle and that awareness about our actions and how they are racialized, we're never going to learn and change our behavior, right? Because we have been, for reasons of like biology, by our uh, unconscious bias, kind of our, our, our brain that does a lot of thinking for us to try to protect us because we've been sent these messages about what, um, what black and brown people, um, uh, you know, horrible messages, negative messages about black and brown people, we, or about power, we act in ways to, that our brain is thinking that uh, it's protecting us when actually it's acting in ways that are, that are racist and, and, and really harmful and traumatizing, right? to um, those that were inflicting that upon. So I think all of that, all of that needs to happen at the same time. If you like, you know, and it needs to happen constantly. So you can't say check, I did level one, <laughs> individual racism done, check level two. It's like, it needs to be happening simultaneously and it needs to be happening constantly. So the racial equity audit you talked about, how, how does one go about doing it? How do, how do you get into that? Yeah, I think there are a lot of different um, organizations that offer racial equity audits, um, and there are a lot of ones that you can do on your own. We did one that was more of a power analysis that was created by the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy and CRP to examine how we are building, wielding, and sharing our power for racial equity um, through our work um, internally and externally. So that's what we did. I think there are one, you know, there are a lot of consultants who do racial equity assessments. Um, we did one with a couple consultants at the RAG. I think I will just, uh, there are a lot of amazing, I will just say, there are a lot of amazing practitioners out there who are doing work like racial equity assessments and audits and helping people build their, uh, their knowledge and capacity around racial equity and racial justice. And I would also say because it's become more mainstream, um, that there are also a lot of consultants that are out there that are doing some harm. You know, we had a consultant who came in and did an unconscious bias training for us that was deeply problematic. And actually, we had to do a lot of work after they left to kind of undo the harm that was perpetrated through that training. So I think, you know, I just one thing that I, I'm so grateful for are so many of the amazing advisors to equity and racial justice and that analysis is baked into who they are and everything that they do. And there are some who are doing it because um, it is it is what people want, right? So I'm just I encourage people to check references, to talk to people who work with them, to really make sure they're the real deal. Um, yeah. So if I can add something or make an observation about your comment about shared power, I always found that if you want to get something done, I think the best way to do is to share that power is, is to empower others to help you get it done. And you yeah. wind up having more power at the end, uh, I think, because of the ability to share with others, to get them involved, to get them to take ownership of, of what you're trying to do. So it's, it, uh, I've seen examples of that. I've seen examples in, 
and of politicians who basically say it's my power, you know, we're gonna we're gonna keep it until we die, and and it's just a nightmare of a fight to try to get things changed and make things more equitable. Uh, what do you yeah. say to our national, some of our national leaders who are saying there's no such thing as systemic racism, that we just need to put that to the side, we don't need to talk about that. Yeah, there's a few bad apples out there, and there's some people who are racist, but there's no such thing as structural racism that uh, we, we took care of that in the 50s and the 60s with the civil rights movement. And we will get her back. We do have a couple of questions on the Q&A line, so um, I will get to those in, in just a little bit. But we need Han to do that. <laughs> We're working on it. So Hans was very helpful to us in LGW. She's a member of this year's class. As I said, she facilitated the second uh, civil rights tour we did um, uh, with us. And uh, she's given us a lot, of, a lot of great insight, a lot of great resources to, to help us through this. So. We want to make sure we get her here so we can hear her words of wisdom. I'm so sorry. We're glad you're back. Are you back? So Beverly Hudnut asked, what, what do I have to say to those folks who say there's no systemic racism? Well, I'd like to hear from Han first. Uh, she's reconnecting right now. Um, and we can, uh, we can ask you all your thoughts on that. If you put them in the Q&A. Hi there, can you hear me? We can hear you, thank you. There you go. Can you hear me, Doug? Yes, yes. Okay. So to those folks who say there's no structure. I hope this is stable. Let's hope. Go ahead. So to folks who say there's no systemic racism, no structural racism in the country, what do you, what do you say to them? We, and that's our national leaders who are telling us to look the other way, that there's nothing yeah. to see over there. Yeah, well, I think they're, I think they're in denial and they don't, one, I think they need to talk to people who are dealing with uh, racism and listen to black justice leaders, right? Um, I think something that we certainly tend to do in philanthropy, and I think in general, um, it, it, especially in white dominant culture, we look for data, we look for reports, we want proof in the numbers, that proof, that proof is out there, you know, I'm, I'm, that, that proof is out there, but for some reason, we don't um, believe in the lived experience and expertise of people who are experiencing the issues. And so, you know, what I say is go and talk to, you know, talk to and really listen to those who are most impacted by racism. One, that, that's the ideal. I probably know that's not gonna happen. If you don't believe in that, look at the impact of COVID-19 on black and brown communities and indigenous communities. Um, you know, the bridge stamp led uh, nonprofit organizations don't get, get like a fraction of the funding of white led organizations. Like these are all. Well, I think we lost her again. So Kim Estes is on and she's participating from Atlanta. Today is their election day and yet they're having all kinds of problems with the new voting machines they have, which will disenfranchise an awful lot of people. 
uh, in that state. The other states that are doing their elections uh, today don't seem to be having any problems in terms of getting people in and out of voting. So let's hope, let's hope we can do that. Can you hear me? Yes. So, uh, Han, a question about, did your foundation do anything to support access to voting in the region? Or are you involved? I'm so sorry. A second to do that. Hopefully, it'll be better. Han? So that's one of the things that we're trying to do is to um, Whoops, I apologize for this. Maybe we should it's been over half an hour. I'm here. I'm sorry. Okay. I just called back in. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so you, you go ahead. So the question was, did your foundation do anything to help with uh, voting access in the region? Are you, are you concerned about uh, people being denied the right to vote, things like that? Deeply so. And so one of, you know, I think about um, the progressive change that uh, the, the work that's being done to build civic engagement um, in in Virginia. And that's work that's taken over 12 years to do, right? Um, that's finally seeing some traction um, in, in the last year. And that is by kind of year round voter engagement, which is happening, has been happening through get up account efforts for the census. And at the same time, getting people to try to, um, to register to vote and ensure that we're getting out the vote as well. And so we definitely think that building a more representative democracy is really important for the, the, the work that needs to happen. So electing people into office who have strong racial equity analysis and commitment to racial justice. And then once they're in office, holding them accountable to what they say they're about and to their citizens and to their, to their constituents. And that is where, you know, we're so thankful to so many of the organizing groups that we support who are really working around the clock and around year round to hold elected officials accountable to their constituencies and equity issues. So I mentioned earlier the, um, the troubles in Georgia today and their election day of people voting. The lines are, uh, Kim S. Uh, sent us a message that the lines are five hours long and they're now looking into election irregularities uh, from their Secretary of State, or the Secretary of State is going to look into election irregularities. So you know, again, when you think you, you solve some problems, you find you step, step way back. Uh, a question on uh, any recommended readings on equity and racial justice. Anything new, anything from the last 50 years that you think might help in the racial equity? Um, I think so, you know, a lot of the, one, the, the series that the racial, that RAG did, uh, that LGW did with RAG, putting racism on the series and expanding the table. Um, all of those, um, those videos are online with discussion guides and kind of viewing guides. So I think those are incredibly valuable and I've shared those with uh, board members who are not able to participate in that training and then had, uh, and staff members, and then had to use those discussion guides to facilitate conversations about race and racial equity and racial justice. So I think that's a really great homegrown um, resource that we have available to us. Um, obviously, I think, you know, Ibn Kemri's book on um, how to be an anti-racist is really powerful. I think Robin D'Angelo's work on white fragility and her book on white fragility are really important. Um, there's there's a lot there's a lot out there, and I would say it's so funny. I was so many organizations have released statements about what's happening, um, kind of given the, the 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 murder of George Floyd and the injustices surrounding that, and you know, there's a lot of resources that people are linking to in those statements. And so my thing is that if you want to know and to learn, like now is the best time to do it because so many people are sharing resources. And I even think in, for me in the Asian American community, resources that are specific to other Asian Americans, right? So understanding kind of the, 
solidarity between Asians and Black uh, people, and then also kind of the the anti-Black racism that exists in the Asian community. So there's there's a lot out there available to us to do the learning that we need to do, and to help have those conversations with our loved ones, with our friends, with our community members. So we'll share the link to those uh, videos with all of the people on the call. Um, once we're through here. And then uh, Debbie, Debbie Alexander sent in something that another resource, the National Museum of African American History and Culture has released a new portal called Talking About Race. There are tools, exercises, videos, articles, and over a hundred multimedia resources for people committed to racial equality. So that's a, that's a great resource that we need to take a look at. And, and we'll get that, we'll get a link out to that to you as well. Um, Han, any, um, any good news that you've had in these last couple months? Anything that surprised you? Anything that's jumped out and say, boy, that's, that's really special? I mean, gosh, this moment is just so powerful and special. So I think about when the Weisberg Foundation created our vision statement four years ago, three years ago. Um, and initially it was about, you know, uh, a world that um, builds that, um, builds power, opportunity, and access so that everyone can thrive, right, regardless of their race. And it was really important for our trustees. They said, you know what, that's great, but we, we just want a world where people acknowledge that structural racism is a thing. That's a vision we think, like, we're so far away from. And what we're seeing now is that there is much more mainstream acknowledgement and recognition that structural racism exists and that it impacts all of us. So I think that's and it's not good that structural racism exists, but it's so powerful that we can at least acknowledge that, right? Because now let's agree on that and let's do the work we need to do to dismantle it. I think other good news, you know, I'm deep in philanthropy. We're a small foundation, so we do a lot beyond funding to try to advance equity. And a lot of that is building the capacity of the philanthropic sector to be operating more equitably. And, you know, I've been on the steering committee for the Greater Washington Community Foundation's Emergency Response Fund, which my classmate Tonya Wellens is leading really masterfully. Um, and just to see that that group of funders that, you know, kind of across the board of funders who might not have the same, might not be in the same place in terms of their, their commitment to racial equity or their understanding or analysis of racial equity, we're able to agree that we want to make sure that we're disrupting the biases in philanthropy and being sure that, you know, that over half or at least half of the organizations we're supporting are led by people of color, right? Because left to our own devices, left to how philanthropy typically operates and our unconscious bias, like we would have probably ended up funding a majority of white led organizations that are not oftentimes those, the ones that are, um, that are, are so, so well positioned to do the work and serve their communities, but often overlooked by philanthropy. So I think that's really great news. There's this, and just in general, there, you know, like I think about the movement for Black Lives and how even five years ago, certainly when it started, it was seen as a really radical, radical movement that a lot of people didn't understand. And as you, 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 you mentioned earlier, we now have 16th Street, right, right in front of the White House called Black Lives Matter Plaza. Like, what the heck, <laughs> right? That's amazing. And so, and, and actually brings me back to the initial thing, question you asked me of the Weisberg Foundation and that we were an arts funder. We still believe in funding the arts, right? And so people are like, well, doesn't, isn't that a little different from the power building work you're doing, the system change work you're doing? And we say, I really, really believe that art is an integral part in the systems change that needs to happen, right? So that Black Lives Matter mural painted in bright yellow in front of the White House, that is art, right? And that's really powerful. And it's both um, uh, what art has the power to um, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, like that to me is the greatest demonstration of that. And so I think that we need to not forget about the arts in this moment. And so um, it's a little plug for the arts and hopefully we are, we're trying to build a group of funders who are going to create an arts fund to make sure that our arts organizations aren't forgotten through this crisis. So other than your Peloton uh, group, have any LGW members reached out to you the last couple of months? Have you reached out to any of them? Is anybody helping you through some of the issues you're dealing with? I mean, so many, right? <laughs> like hashtag LGW is everywhere. Seriously, like every, every day I'm interacting with another LGW member and oftentimes in multiple ways, either directly through the work and collaboration that we're doing in philanthropy um, 
or kind of socially making sure that we're getting together and connecting and taking care of each other, the Peloton group for sure, but I mentioned the leadership of Tonya Willens at the Community Foundation, Heather Peeler and Kira Jarrett, who are leading our racial equity working group at the RAG, Tamara Copeland, the former president of the RAG, who is now a trustee uh, on the Weisberg Foundation board, um, you know, Nikki Gorn, who's on the board of the RAG, uh, Jennifer Lockwood Shabbat at the Women's Foundation. I, the list can go on and on. And even tonight, um, I'll give a shout out to Debbie. Um, Charlotte Reed and Rachel Kronowitz, they've been convening this kind of monthly dinner, I think for several years now, since the LGW RAG expanding the table for racism series, every, you know, the second Tuesday of every month to talk about race issues. And we have one of those conversations tonight. And so that's been a wonderfully supportive space and group. And so um, I, I just encourage people to find those spaces to be able to, especially if we're talking about race, to talk across race about racial issues, but also talk within race, right? And this is something that, bring it back to the civil rights learning journey that we did was um, we broke people into caucuses based on race, which is always a little, makes people a little nervous, right? They seem like, well, we're talking about racial equity and bringing everyone together. Why are we breaking up people by race? I think it's because we have to acknowledge our shared experiences and how sometimes it's easier to talk to others with those shared experiences and backgrounds about really tough issues. And that the point is we then come back together and work together and collaborate together. But it's important to keep those spaces as well and protect those spaces for ourselves. So as we wrap up, what, what can we do to advance anti-racism? What, what can we do to help you and your work? What can we do to help this cause of, of racial equity? I just, I, I'm so heartened that even that you reached out to have this conversation, right? And that LGW is, 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 is convening a program to talk about anti-racism and what it means. So I think normalizing and socializing the conversation and then I think, you know, holding ourselves and each other accountable to really um, doing the learning and unlearning we need to do as individuals and that we, if we commit to that as individuals, like how are we living into those values? That accountability piece is hugely important, right? It's just like having an exercise buddy. Like it's, you're probably, you're probably going to be so much better at it if you have an accountability partner. And the same is important for race work, like you need to be able to hold yourself accountable and those around you accountable to the commitment to racial justice and racial equity and being anti-racist. So I see a huge role for LGW, particularly as you're bringing so many people cross-sector together to talk about the most important issues in our region and to try to create a, a, a stronger region that's tapping into these best minds. Like having a strong racial equity analysis and race frame, um, I know it makes some people uncomfortable, but I think now more than ever, we're seeing why it's, 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 it's uh, essential and relevant to everything that we do in every sector and kind of in every part of our lives. So I'll leave it to you for a final word right as we close. <laughs> wow, I, um, what, else, what else to say beyond that? I just wanna <laughs> really appreciate uh, I, one, I apologize for the video issues. If it's not my dog barking, it's my internet, it's something. So I appreciate the patience and every, you and everyone hanging on through all of that. Um, and then I appreciate this space to talk and I encourage us to keep having these conversations and I'm happy to have them one-on-one -on -one or to have them with groups. And I, I say, um, not, not because I'm an expert, but because I'm committed to the work and I'm, I'm living the work. And there are a lot of other LGW members who are also deeply committed to this work, who are living this work. Um, and I think kind of with that and continuing to strengthen our muscle around it, we can be incredibly powerful, even more powerful than we are. Um, thank you so much. Kara Jarrett just gave you a shout out. So, uh, thank you so <laughs> much for this conversation. Thanks for taking your time. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, and folks, thank you for joining us. And we've got several more of these conversations coming up. So stay tuned to LGW and what we're doing. Han, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Doug. Thanks. Thanks, Debbie.